As the jet age dawned in the 1950s, many now iconic aircraft took to the skies. Many famous transport aircraft, airliners, bombers, and fighters, but one design would stand out among them all as one of the most recognized aircraft of all time. That aircraft would be the F-86 Sabre. The idea behind the Sabre dates back to the end of World War II. As tensions rose between East and West, the United States began paying more attention to the Soviet defense industry and what they were developing. The Americans and Soviets alike were keenly interested in German jet aircraft technology and were highly motivated to develop their own jets in response. For the United States Defense Force, early designs such as the Navy's FJ-1 Fury, the Air Force's P-80 Shooting Star, and the P-84 were considered unimpressive in contrast to German concepts. Retaining the same straight-wing design of the P-51 and other prop fighters, these early jets gained speed but lacked performance in other areas. In fact, many pilots preferred the P-51 F-4U Corsair and other more conventional prop-driven aircraft due to their fuel efficiency, allowing them to operate over a combat zone for far longer. However, the United States Army Air Force wanted its own jet, and they wanted it to outperform anything else in the sky. This project would become known as the XP-86 project. As with the USAF and Navy projects, designers for the XP-86 project started with a straight-wing design. This was not ideal, and many within the Army soon realized that the project would essentially be a waste of resources if there was not some fundamental innovation. As more information regarding German World War II designs emerged, it became obvious that the German researchers wanted to invest heavily in swept-wing designs. Although much information about German designs and future plans had been lost, what information remained suggested that the swept-wing design would be the answer to many hindrances surrounding high-speed flight, high roll speed, and maneuverability. The Americans were aware that the Soviets were also working on a jet which utilized the swept wing design. Information was scant in regards to Soviet jet development, but what was apparent was what looked like cutting-edge design, however unproven in capability. The pressure was on the Americans to innovate, and the XP-86 program went with a swept wing design closer to aircraft like the ME-262. To better understand the emergence of the design of the F-86, it is also important to understand its primary rival, the MiG-15, and how the many concepts floating around regarding jet aircraft design would all come together into one project. During the late 1940s, the Soviet Union began working on its own jet fighters. Initially, they attempted to base designs on captured German jet technology, but struggled to make significant ground. At the war's end, the Germans had destroyed many of their yet-to-be-developed concepts and future plans, while surviving German scientists, who understood the technology and future direction, had left for the United States or England. Consequently, the Soviets simply sought out anyone who was willing to sell them high-quality jet technology. Stalin was quoted as saying, What fool will sell us his secrets? To the surprise of the Soviets, the British responded, offering the Rolls-Royce Nain, a centrifugal compressor turbojet engine, which was being developed for the de Havilland Vampire. These engines would become the crucial missing piece of the puzzle, and would allow the Soviets to begin development of fully capable jet fighters. The Nien engine was studied, reverse engineered, and improved upon, while other teams simultaneously developed an airframe around it. At this point, some of the researchers appeared to have finally understood what the Germans had been attempting to achieve, especially after studying the designs of the Fokker Wolf TA-183. The TA-183 Huckabine had been developed as a concept in 1945, drawing inspiration from the Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet, a swept-wing design so fast that its speed records would not be broken until the 1947 Bell X-1 supersonic flight. The Comet's swept-wing design had never made sense on any aircraft up until this point. Prop aircraft, 
would not have had the speed to benefit from it, but faster jets would. Using this as a basis, two further aircraft were conceptualized, the Messerschmitt ME-263 Schola and the TA-183. Both had larger wings and a raised horizontal tailplane, but retained the large swept wing which was so successful on the comet. When Soviet engineers looked back over these old concepts, they realized that the Germans had discovered the secret to the future of jet design. Better still for the Soviets, it seemed as if rivals had not yet caught up. The Americans were still using old design principles for their jet aircraft, like the P-80 Shooting Star, the F-94 Starfire, and the Navy's F-9F Panther. And this meant that if someone could perfect the swept wing design, and if the design performed as predicted, then they would dominate the skies. The result was one of the most iconic aircraft ever produced in the East, the MiG-15. With a sleek swept wing design, the MiG-15 marked the start of a new era for air combat. It would be put to the test during the closing weeks of the Chinese Civil War in 1950, after Mao Zedong requested help from the Soviets in holding back airstrikes from Taiwan. The jet succeeded in all capacities, and soon after, it would have the opportunity to prove itself again, but this time, on the global stage. When the Korean War began in 1950, the United States Air Force and Navy had decided that the best approach to the region was to integrate modified World War II prop aircraft, such as the P-51, Corsair, and B-29, with jet fighters and strike aircraft. For the first months of the war, this paid off. The North Korean Air Force was using outdated World War II Soviet prop aircraft, presenting no real air threat to either US fighter pilots or the crews of the B-29 bombers. In these early days of the war, flights of B-29s were able to hold back the advancing North Korean forces. But this would not last. The MiG-15 would enter the war unexpectedly. Several aircraft were already based in Shanghai and were sent to locations in the far north of Korea. Shortly after, on October 25, 1950, China entered the war. The Soviets had no intention of joining the conflict. Rather, they sent experienced Russian pilots to train Chinese and North Koreans on the MiG-15, leaving operational duties to the People's Liberation Army Air Force, the official air force of the Chinese Communist Party. However, small selections of Soviet pilots would unofficially operate the aircraft alongside the Koreans and Chinese. On November 1, 1950, just a few days after the Chinese officially entered the war, this plan sprang into action when a group of Soviet pilots of the 64th Fighter Aviation Corps arrived at Antung Air Base. Later that same day, the Soviet pilots were given the green light to launch several flights of MiGs and hunt for American aircraft. The first engagement followed within an hour, when eight MiGs intercepted 10 P-51 Mustangs. The Mustangs were on close air support for ground troops and were caught off guard, with several damaged or destroyed. A few hours later, a flight of three MiGs attacked 10 P-80 shooting stars, destroying one and damaging others. The afternoon of November 1st was chaotic for Allied forces, with reports coming in from various squadrons of fast, nimble attacking aircraft. The pilots didn't really know what was happening, and due to the speed of the attacks, it was hard to identify the aircraft. Analysts suspected it was the new MiG. A few weeks later, a B-29 escorted by a P-80 also reported light damage as a jet passed by. The escorting P-80 attempted to identify the aircraft, but it quickly faded to a dot and disappeared. Eerily similar to American pilots first encountering jets over German airspace several years earlier. The only solid evidence of what was happening had occurred on November 9th, when a Navy F-9F stumbled across a slow-flying and unsuspecting MiG-15, which it subsequently shot down, proving what many had suspected. This was a serious shock to the Americans, and likely had a negative effect on morale. Up to this point, the shooting star had been America's preeminent fighter, patrolling the skies of North Korea and denying airspace to anything which stood against it. But the surprise arrival of the MiG-15, complete with well-trained Russian, Chinese and North Korean pilots, meant that even the best United Nations designs would struggle against this new threat. The Russians were already working on an improved next generation of the MiG. This called for a serious response. 
the response would be the North American F-86 Sabre, a design which had been in the works for some time, but had many similarities to the MiG-15. The Sabre had been developed during the same period as the MiG-15, following roughly the same design principles put forth by the Germans. The Sabre was the first US aircraft to utilize German research from World War II. Because of its new and untested design, it had been a mystery to the Americans as to whether or not either the Sabre or the MiG would be effective. The MiG-15 proved the design was not only effective, but more deadly than anything else in the air. Upon arrival in Korea, it was discovered that the early variants of the Sabre lacked the necessary speed, sealing and turning rate of the MiG, and improvements were proposed, including modifications to the airframe and changing armament. Up until this point, the US Air Force had often armed their fighter aircraft with 50 caliber machine guns. However, during the later years of World War II, Germany and some Japanese units had begun outfitting their aircraft with larger cannons, which had previously been an anti-tank weapon used on aircraft such as the Stuka. Cannons were initially seen as inhibiting, since they fired slowly and thus left more room for error. However, the MiG-15 with its 23mm and 37mm cannons proved that larger armament would drastically improve probability of kill. It was decided that newer versions of the Sabre would be equipped with four 20mm cannons. Despite these drawbacks, what early version of the Sabre did have over the MiG was an advanced gun sight known as the APG-30. Better control at speeds, particularly in the dive, and hydraulically pressurized flight controls, which meant pilots would become less fatigued during long fights. The MiG-15, despite being faster, would become unstable and harder to control. This came down to a key difference between the two aircraft, the tailplane. Warnings were heeded, information recorded, and pilot experience was considered. And after some time, the improved F-86F would arrive, finally capable of matching and even outperforming the MiG-15 in air-to-air -air combat. By the end of the Korean War, despite various drawbacks, the F-86 came out on top against the MiG. The statistics remain controversial and vary widely, with initial estimates claiming a 10 to 1 ratio over the MiG, while later sources claim a 2 to 1 ratio. Regardless, the Sabre held more victories against the MiG by the end of the war. Even against trained Soviet pilots, figures still estimate that the Sabre came out on top with a win-to-lose ratio of 1.3 to 1. Throughout all of this, Australia had been attempting to purchase the Sabre. However, the RAAF's dream of owning the aircraft had been continually put on hold. Beginning in 1950, the RAAF had asked for Sabres to replace its prop-driven aircraft based in Korea. However, the U.S. was pressed for time, and priority was given to U.S. armed forces who needed as many aircraft as could be delivered in order to counter the MiG-15. In response, permission was given to the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation to design a RAAF-specific Sabre in 1951. This would save the U.S. from sending its own Sabres and allow the Australians to custom produce the aircraft for themselves. Initially, the Australians were going to apply a minor redesigned F-86F model. However, after serious consideration, it was decided that a massive redesign process would be undertaken. This would include the redesign of roughly 60% of the fuselage, the addition of new 30mm Aden cannons, and the enlargement of the air intake by 25%. Much of this was necessary to accommodate its most significant upgrade, a new engine. Rather than using the standard General Electric J47, the CAC model Sabre would use the Rolls-Royce Avon RA7 jet engine. The upgrade was worth it, since the Rolls-Royce would produce 50% more thrust than the standard J47, thus giving the CAC Sabre an edge when it came to acceleration and overall speed. The CAC Sabre would see action in 1958, when 3 Squadron and 77 Squadron were sent to help the British during the Malayan emergency. The aircraft would be based in Malaysia from 1958 to 1960, and took part in several bombing missions against communist insurgents in the region. Six Sabres operated during this period. Then in 1962, with the situation escalating in Southeast Asia, the RAAF sent eight Sabres to the Ubon Air Base in Thailand. Operating the Sabres would be 79 Squadron, 
which was reformed in 1962, specifically for this purpose. The goal was to assist the friendly Thai and Laotian defense forces who were facing attacks from communist guerrillas in the region. The Sabres would work alongside the Royal Thai Air Force in securing the region and providing assistance to friendly troops on the ground as part of an international task force set up in case of an attack on Thailand by one of its neighbors. By 1965, the base would be expanded in its use as the Vietnam War ramped up, now hosting a variety of American aircraft. Among them included the first F-4Cs to arrive in the Vietnam War, then later B-57s, AC-47 gunships, and the first Loran-capable F-4Ds. Even the first prototype of the AC-130A gunship would see its first action based out of Ubon. The base was highly important due to its location, and the Sabres would play an important role, as they were tasked specifically with airbase defense, protecting American and Thai aircraft from any incoming threats. This would continue from 1965 through to 1968. During this period, 79 Squadron would also play the aggressors in war game exercises against USAF and Royal Thai air crews. The Sabres would adopt MiG-17 tactics, to which American and Thai pilots would need to counter. The relationship between 79 Squadron and their American and Thai counterparts must have been good, because General Hunter Harris Jr., commander of the U.S. Pacific Air Forces, wrote to RAAF Air Marshal Alistair Murdoch. In the letter, he suggested that 79 Squadron should join the U.S. Air Force in its operations against the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which were being undertaken by other aircraft out of Ubon. The Thai Air Force and government also backed this decision, so long as it was kept unofficial. However, the RAAF would reject the offer, on the grounds that they were not willing to commit more pilots to Southeast Asia. By 1968, it was decided that after over a decade and a half of service, that the Sabre had served its purpose and was becoming obsolete. That same year in July, 79 Squadron would be disbanded as the Sabre was slowly phased out of RAAF service. This was due to a number of factors. Firstly, as time went on, 79 Squadron found themselves without a clear role or objective at the base. Ubon was now constantly busy and had more than enough fighters to defend the base and all of Thailand if need be. The US Air Force was also hesitant to send up the Sabres against intruding aircraft since Australian rules of engagement stated that the Sabres could not pursue contacts that left Thai airspace, while the American pilots did not have the same restrictions. Ultimately, this decision came at the right time, since the Sabre was showing its age, and it was time to send the squadron back home. RAAF CAC Sabres would serve for another three years, finally retiring in 1971. The aircraft were then handed on to the Royal Malaysian Air Force, and the Indonesian Air Force, serving with RMAF No. 11 Squadron and IAF No. 14 Squadron, respectively, where they would continue to serve until 1982, over 30 years after the early models began rolling off the assembly line. The Sabre remains perhaps the deadliest jet aircraft to have ever served with the RAAF. During its lifetime, spanning from USAF operations in Korea, through to the development of modified airframes for the Canadian and Australian Air Forces, and finally to its retirement in 1994 from the Bolivian Air Force, the Sabre has upwards of 500 kills to its name, with some suggesting over 700. Regardless of its variant or iteration, the Sabre design remains one of the most iconic and recognizable airframes ever built, and a symbol of the jet age.